This is Packer and Durham on ACCN and Sirius XM Channel 371. We are looking for the ultimate winner. You're making the decision tomorrow with, or no, they got to get eliminated. And now That's you're right. pushing it, at Mr. Atlanta. I didn't you're say the one. Hey, the, I've seen Braves up 3 1 against the, the Dodgers. Team I before. Follow got shelled last yeah, night. Yeah, how they the doing? Pretty good. So the hat's still available. You want to get creative, you can get it. I'm going to announce the winner as soon as the Dodgers are eliminated. From the face of the earth. From the face <laughs> of the earth. <laughs> All right. Let's get, let's get I had work. somebody ask me, did, did the Dodgers do something to Packer in yes. his life? Yes. Yes. They were, they were I, formed. I said, yes, they existed. They existed. <laughs> That's exactly they were they correct. were quite concerned with your I, I've told you because you don't have venom against many none per se zero <laughs> okay except the Dodgers I open I've said this before I said I'm fair with everybody you openly I root openly for the Giants. root against the, yeah, Dodgers. the Dodgers I really do not like anything about them yeah there you go all right nothing so all I good. loved watching the Bravos yeah. Roddy Jones's team your guy Roddy yeah Roddy's big Braves guy. My mother-in-law, my wife. Everybody I know is a Braves fan. Yeah, Braves country. Well, if we were right in the heart of That's it exactly down here in the right. South. Yeah, it started with the old Ted Turner Superstation, right? Bob Horner. That's it. Playing in front of like 35 people. Maybe. <laughs> you'd go to a Braves game back then, man, you'd, you'd come home with like 17 foul balls. Seriously. Yeah. If, there was, if there's a ball was in hey. the stands, you could go walk over there and grab it. I will say this. The best television broadcast of all time were bad Braves games. Was Skip Carey and Pete Van Weeren and Ernie Johnson Sr. The absolute. You talk about liners and reading things. Skip Carey. It's kind of like this tonight. Show. Following the Braves, yeah. another edition of F Troop. Right. Really? <laughs> We're running F Troop. <laughs> it was awesome. They kind of mocked their own network. Oh, it which was, I can really appreciate. Yeah, I mean, the owner was sitting right down in the front row. So right. he, whatever. What are you gonna do? Fires? Yeah. I know he's watching. So the way we roll. It's, well, it's kind of it's kind of like. <laughs> like I say, I mean, I mean, it's television. I mean, you, you can't take yourself so seriously. I'll tell you what happens sometimes when you start doing that. You end up driving golf carts at the cross country can't championship. T minus <laughs> eight days. Oh my gosh! They'll probably kick me out. I figure by the time I get to South Bend, they'll be like, "Oh, yeah. I don't think this is really a good idea." Uh, maybe. Let's just appease him. Yeah. Get him something to eat. Yeah, get him something to eat. Show him around the campus, right. and we'll put him back on the plane. We'll take him over to Touchdown Jesus, yeah. and then start the race. He'll yeah. never know. <laughs> He'll, that's exactly <laughs> so. Uh, week eight in the ACC coming up starts uh, right here on ACC Network at noon. UMass Florida State, the first game of our triple header. I found out yesterday, by the way, and John Curry, the athletics director at Wake Forest, is going to join us here at the bottom of the hour. Got to be a happy man. Got a sellout on our hands at Mikey Stadium. Oh, that's a big game now. I'm telling you, and if you're a Wake fan and you've never been oh, it's the best. to West Point, it's it best. is stunningly beautiful. It's this time great, of year? Oh, oh it's, well, it's, it's an incredible place just to walk around mm-hmm. the tradition, the history, uh, and what that place means. And it's a great road trip, first of all. It's yep. a beautiful place. And when you sit in a stadium and look around and if the trees are changing, I'm assuming they are, mid to late October, uh, it will be stunningly beautiful and uh, it, it, I can't imagine a better road trip, quite frankly, this I, time of the year. Go up there and play with Army. Be great. Uh, it, in December, it's gorgeous. I mean, let alone October. Well, we it's, go up, you know, the Army-Navy game, which oh, is my favorite game in college football, yeah. uh, to be honest with you, and what, what it really, truly stands for. It's in New York this year. Yeah. 20-year anniversary. Met life. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, normally it's in Philly, which I love Philly. Why? Because the hotel they Terminal stick us in. It's right across the street from Terminal Market, which means Amish Bakery for breakfast. The Knicks for lunch, and then you just kind of do the rotation, right? I love Philadelphia. Um, but it'll be in New York this year. But for anybody that's – if you're a Wake Forest fan, seriously, and have never been and you're thinking about it, go. Seriously, just go. And number one, I think the game will be good. And number two, you will just be blown away by West Point. It mm. is sensational. Yeah. Fantastic. Really a great environment, and that starts the weekend schedule. It feels like, though – and we've got a couple games. We touched on this briefly the other day. Here's the full slate, by the way. Wake on the road at Army. UMass, Florida State. Those are the noon games. Syracuse, Virginia Tech. Huh. Clemson at Pitt is the headliner nationally uh, at 3.30 in terms of ACC play. Boston College is at Louisville. 
uh, 4 o'clock, and then NC State's at Miami, Georgia Tech, Virginia, late night in primetime presented by Geico here on ACC Network. Um, in t- we, we spoke about this with BC, Louisville, Syracuse, Virginia Tech. Kind of crossroads games? How's your season going? Da da da. It kind of goes back to the theory that you talked about last year. With all the things going through, at what point would somebody tap out? You worry about where maybe some of this could fall. You don't know. I mean, I, I talked to Jeff Halfley and Frank Signetti and Tim Lukabu yesterday in preparation for Saturday's game. They're excited to kind of keep the thing going despite – they're pumped about where their program is. They're pumped about the attitude and the approach. And they know that it was 33-7 last Saturday night, but was it really 33-7? You know, I mean, NC State had three or four it breakaways. Was. Okay. I mean, last time I checked, it's still 33 I understand. I'm just telling you what they said. Um, they felt like they maybe had more in it except for three or four snaps and plays that, that broke off and changed the game. To a degree, they're right. To a degree, NC State deserves a lot of credit for being a three-way football team, offense, defense, special teams. Yeah, I mean, we play 60 minutes, not 30. I understand. So, there's where that is with BC. Louisville comes off the disappointment, a bye week, the loss to Virginia where they had the lead. Cavaliers make the comeback. Then you go to Blacksburg. I think there's more dire straits in Blacksburg than Louisville. Okay. Because I'm with you on BC still being upbeat with what they are building. Correct. And this is part of the stepping stone with Louisville. And in some respects, with Coach Sat, same deal. I mean, they've got to be completely bummed out with how they did not finish the Virginia game. And a bye game. week on the back of it. Right, so they've had two weeks to let that simmer, that fourth quarter mm-hmm. simmer with Virginia coming in there and Brendan Armstrong throwing it all over the yard. I think it's a different deal in Blacksburg. I do. Uh, the Hokies have had back-to-back weeks at home. Here right. we go again. At home, LL. Mm-hmm. Um Front-loaded schedule. What started off with a bang with Virginia is now kind of whimpered into right. late October. Uh, and offensively, they're still struggling. Right, mm-hmm. defensively, the defense is hanging in there, doing their thing, best job they can. Offense is still not sure what it is. Syracuse has now had three straight LLL that could have been WWW. I mean, literally a play, a call, one executed, anything. Correct is the difference in the game. Mm-hmm. I get a sense that the loser in Blacksburg is a loser leave town match. I, I really do think it's kind of a breaking point for the loser of that game, hmm. in my opinion. Now, well, we'll it, find out. But Virginia Tech in particular, because everything has been front loaded with home games, it was all about the quick start. They got against North Carolina. You're thinking, oh my goodness, couldn't have scripted a better start for Justin Fuente. All of a sudden, you had the hiccup at West Virginia. You couldn't score in the red zone. You're there all day. Had a chance even late. Thing falls apart. But, man, alive. The last two weeks were killers. Yep. Notre Dame, you got to close. I've emphasized that to the point when the Hokie fans are sick of me saying it, but it's the truth. And Pitt just came in there and bloodied your nose. That was a hangover from Notre Dame. I'm not taking anything away from Pitt. Their defense played great. But, man, Wes, when that schedule popped up, you knew – that they had to get into November kind of with a lead, right? Yep. And here they are at three and stinking three and taking on a Syracuse team that I think is more upbeat about what they're doing than where the Hokies kind of find themselves I right now. I agree with that. Totally agree. And I think Virginia Tech, and here it is, there's the back end of the schedule. And for the final five on the road after Saturday, and you see in Atlanta, uh, at BC, at Miami, at Virginia to finish. I mean, there's nothing fun about that. And especially if you can't close the deal at home this week. I mean, yeah. if you roll into that stretch, three and four, and four of your last five are away from home, mm-hmm. from that great crowd, I mean, good luck. It's hard to win on the road, period. I don't care who you are. By the way, our friends down the road, FPI, have the Hokies as a 70% chance to win on Saturday, uh, 85 against Duke, and everything else is sub-50. And in the case of the last two, 28% chance at Miami, 30% chance at Virginia. I don't, none of that matters. Really. I know that. But I'm just offering that that's how steep the hill might be for I'll give you Virginia an FPI. Tech. Free Packer information. None of that matters. <laughs> FPI. Free Packer information. Okay. Like somebody sent me a note the other day, apparently on social media. Hmm. Social media put that uh, the percentages to win the conference, the co- excuse me, the coastal division, and they gave it for NC State, Wake Forest, and Clemson. And somebody asked me to comment on that. And I said, I'll give you an FPI, free packer information. Hmm. 
Uh, the chances for Wake Forest, NC State, and Clemson to win the Coastal That's would zero. be 0.0%. Zero zero. Zero That's right, zero. They're not in that division. That's right. Um, the game sets up to be kind of a Sean Tucker, Syracuse's powers the run game against the Virginia Tech defense. It's been steady um, all, until Kenny Pickett showed up. <laughs> I well, mean, you know, Pickett didn't have the the he didn't explosive. Have, but they ran. Heisman. They ran the ball against him. That's what you said. Yeah, and Kenny Pickett didn't have the hey, let me go throw it for four hundred and give you a Brendan Armstrong impersonation. He didn't have to. Mm-hmm. Number one, it was blustery. The conditions were were not conducive to throwing it all over the yard, and they just lined up, and ran the football, right? Took the lead and said, hey, you know what? Our defense is going to play great. We're going to hold you two hundred twenty four yards. We're good. We're just going to keep you at arm's length all day, and they did. So I, I would need to see the want to from Virginia Tech's defense this week because if mm-hmm. they don't bring it, Wes, yeah, Sean Tucker will go nuts now. Sean Tucker doesn't care. You do whatever you want. Thirty four is going to run the ball. He's a grown man now. Tell what, guy's uh, guys on a lot of midseason All America teams too. It's been terrific, man. He's been really good. Holy smokes! So you better bring your A game. Tackle 34. Mm-hmm. If you're not in the mood, that'll be a long day. So you put a premium on this one, maybe mm-hmm. half step back is BC Louisville. I'm not going to put a premium on it. It's kind of a loser leave town I know match. that, but what I'm saying is of the two, this one is the one. I think this one's got bigger repercussions for the loser. Okay. All right. Than the other one. Because I still think BC, if BC loses at Louisville, right. I still, still think Jeff Halfley's got those guys thinking, hey, we're building something here still. And you want to make sure that it doesn't become a three-game losing streak. I think with Satterfield, it's the same deal. You know, they kind of look around and go, man, we let that Virginia thing get away. Let's make sure that doesn't happen again this week. Mm-hmm. I think that game will be incredibly competitive. Yeah, you, I, I know too. you got the call. I think it'll be a fun game back and forth. But I think there's more pressure to the loser of Syracuse, Virginia Tech, Sarah, for yeah, me. I agree with that. I think Louisville's remaining schedule is interesting. Uh, two road games at NC State, at Duke, Clemson, Syracuse, and Kentucky, all at Cardinal Stadium. Tough. There's some, there's some tough games on that list. Yeah. My man. Look, look at the but, but it's not the uh, when we just showed you Virginia Tech with four of the last five. By the way, that's been a hokey talking point since the winter when it came out. Um, the back end of Virginia Tech schedule. Well, you can just see, you know, at Wake was a loss. Terrific effort, controversial call mm-hmm. in that game. Uh, the Virginia game you let slip away. You know, right. it, and that's it's the same thing with BC. You, you, somebody's walking down there with a three game losing streak. Right. And when you look with what is remaining with that Louisville schedule, yeah. at NC State is no picnic. Clemson, anytime with that defense, will not be fun. Syracuse, who knows? They could still be engaged and really, really ready to play. Yeah. Uh, at Duke, you'll take that one. Thank you very much at Wallace Wade Outdoor. And Kentucky's no joke. So this is a really important game for Louisville. Let me show you BC's uh, slate here as well because this is of note. At Louisville and then at Syracuse for the Eagles – so think about it in this light. If you bracket these, let's say BC wins Saturday at Louisville, Syracuse wins at Blacksburg, then all of a sudden it's almost like you're kind of playing your way back into it a little bit. And then you go to November, Virginia Tech at the Dome, uh, I mean Virginia Tech at Alumni Stadium, and then at Georgia Tech, Florida State at home in November, and Wake Forest Saturday after Thanksgiving, Mark. See, I like the fact you got three of the last four at home, and if you're still kind of dialed in, going, "Hey guys, guess what? We're bowling. Let's go to a, let's go to the biggest bowl we can go to." I, I like your chances in November. Three mm-hmm. of the last four at home. Uh, you know that Wake Forest game is going to have huge implications, regardless. Right. Well, here's the here's the other thing I was noting about BC looking at their slate. You win Saturday. If you're Jeff Halfley, you come back from those two tough losses. You kind of look at that. You're kind of looking at eight nine window. Potentially. Right. Totally agree. And that's a huge jump. Oh. They they that number seven in Chestnut Hill, those folks know. Seems like there was a limit that hey, once you got to seven, your season stopped. Yeah. You gotta bust that door down. But I I like where they're going. Yeah. I, I have bought into Jeff Halfley from day one. He's been good. The Packer and Durham Podcast. Here's Mark Packer and Wes Durham. Fellas hit the streets this morning. Boys out on the road this yeah, morning. Yeah, they did. Do we leash up when we walk the neighborhood in the morning at no, 4 a.m.? No leash. Oh, no leash. We run wild. Run wild. Okay. It's 3.30 yeah. in the morning. There's ain't nobody out there but me, the deer, 
Some coyotes. Did you see the, the deer? Did you see any deer this morning? Uh, not this morning. Not this morning. Okay, good. Heard it swoop, though. Swoop was rocking it back here. He's our owl. <laughs> we named him Swoop. You know why we named him Swoop? Why is that? Because he swoops down and grabs varmint Stuff. and takes them back. We had a red tailed hawk the other day in my back. Looked like he found Kershaw. Folks, it's like when you pull up here in the morning, it's like you've come to some wilderness animal expo back here at Chateau Pike. We kind of like it out here in the middle of nowhere. Uh huh. That's right. Middle of nowhere. You. Middle of nowhere. John Curry coming up in about 11 minutes. Uh, all right. We're at the midway point. As Mark said, we got to do this now because yeah. Monday we're past the midway point. There's a so, shelf life for so this segment. Far beyond us not to jump in on the mid season accolades. Everybody else has got one. We figured we might. This as well is not in trivia. There. You got to have a good attitude. I have a great attitude. Okay. I think it's a good idea. I thought just, th- we just, should do this. Just so we know, it's not trivia. Well, I'm not doing trivia. You're a full participant. All right, here we are. We're offensive. I wish that was true for live reads on serious defense as well. and coach. We'll get to that. That's the business side of this. That's, that's a, my business. That's another channel and another situation. Next contract. All right. So let's get to the offensive player of the year. To me, it's a two-guy race, and that's it. I agree with you. And it's Armstrong and Kenny Pickett, I agree and that's with you. the decision, right? Yes. Mid- midway, I think it's a two-horse race. I'm not sure. Sean Tucker's the only one I see beyond those two that could potentially enter the conversation in the second He's half. He's been great, but I'm not going to put him with those two quarterbacks. Not. Tucker's been awesome. Mm-hmm. Great, great, great. But now, I, think, I think it's a Kenny Pickett – Brendan Armstrong, choose your poison. And here's the truth in some respect. This may come down to the head-to-head. And that's crazy. That's absolutely I don't crazy. Know about that. I don't know about that. Some people, though, the way this thing gets voted sometimes. Wes, you know a, that. Wait a minute. It's a midway point. We're, we're not talking futures. I know. We're talking about the midway. The midway what right we've now. Seen. So they haven't seen each I, other. We've, we've kind of played our hand on this this week but in this discussion. You're with Brennan Armstrong, and I'm with Kenny Pickett. You know, I love Pickett because he's been on the show 11 sure. times. Or Brennan 17 Armstrong's times. been on the show. He's good, too. But not like Kenny Pickett. No. Kenny Pickett's been one of our boys. Right. All right. But Armstrong's numbers, to me, are right. so spectacular that there is a gap between his numbers and everybody else. Right. Now, what I love about Kenny Pickett mm-hmm. is 21-1. and one. That's touchdown to interception ratio. Sure. Which tells me he, number one, is putting up terrific numbers – and he's managing the football game, mm-hmm. right? And Pitt's ranked in the top 25. Virginia is not. But as far as uh, the uh, the question is, the offensive midway point guy, who is it? There's nobody better than this guy. Right. Brendan Armstrong's numbers are stupid. That's correct. And I'm not talking about in comparison to Kenny Pickett. I'm talking about in comparison to everybody playing college football. It's stupid what he's doing. Mm-hmm. And I love what Bronco Mendenhall has done with his offensive weapons. He creates matchups which are a nightmare, and Brennan Armstrong has delivered. Yep, I, You can't argue with his numbers. Well, and Kenny Pickett finds himself – this is why the race is so compelling. Kenny Pickett finds himself top five nationally in pass efficiency, points responsible per game, touchdowns, and total offense. He's throwing it for 81 more yards per game than Kenny Pickett, who's been great. But I do think it's a 1-1-A debate. It is. It's – I mean, I don't know. We'll have to go back in the 30-odd years that they've had you know, people vote for this. I don't know how close the race has been. But at the midway point, this would be close, I think. It's a tough gig, man. These two guys have been fantastic. And, and look, it just goes to show you how little preseason anything oh. means. Because <laughs> I'll go back to our May, June, July. Let's Awful. start sampling the ACC we knew how good the quarterback room was going to be because it's really deep in the league. But it kind of started with Sam Howell. He was the highest And then it guy. was De'Eric King. Right. And, and then it went to whatever you wanted. Yeah. And Malik Cunningham. Malik great Cunningham year. was in there. And Sam yeah. Hartman's been out of sight for the undefeated well, folks spent. from Switzerland. So the point of it is, hey, that's why you play. You hear that cliche, but it's so true. But these two dudes right here, one and one A. Like I said, choose your poison. They have both been terrific. All right. Now, the it's not as clear cut on the defensive side. No. And the interesting thing about the defensive side is you you got to identify and then process here. It's not just say, well, that guy's good, that guy's good, and that guy's good, and there's three guys. You have to identify three levels, three different kinds of players, okay? 
you got a defensive end, you got a Mike linebacker, and you got a space linebacker, guy that plays in space. In essence, you've created three. Now, there may be more. There's a defensive end of another school that could very well get into this who's on some midseason All-America teams. But let's start with Jermaine Johnson at Florida State because one of the stats that we talked about through the summer and into the early part of the season was Florida State had 10 sacks all of last year. Well, at the midway point, this guy's got seven. (laughs) He's got seven of them. And he's been sensational. He's been really good, in fact. Jermaine Johnson has got to be in the conversation. I, I, I'm not going to go with him, but he's going to be on the short list. I understand list. that. All right. Okay. Going to be on the short list. Now, so he's a defensive end. I'm not telling you Cody Roscoe can't be on this list. I think Cody Roscoe's made some midseason All America teams at Syracuse. Yep. He's having oil of a year. He's a guy that I think could emerge. This race is much more involved than the offensive race at this juncture. Yeah, this is kind of choose your flavor right? Uh, based on what is, it, okay. what is it that you're looking for from a defensive standpoint. And the Orange defense has been one of the great surprises of the ACC and good for Tony White and Coach Babers and everybody there. Here's the guy, though, at Syracuse that is making a name nationally. Mikel Jones, we thought would be pretty good. Oh, he's been better than that. Mikel Jones has been sensational. Top 10 in FBS in solo tackles per game, Mark. It's my pick here. This is where I'm going to go. If I Midway point, it could certainly change in the second half. But, man, he's been so consistently good, Wes. Every week he puts up numbers. And, you know, he's second in the ACC in tackles. He's eighth in tackles for loss. He is a problem, right? Yep. He is a real problem. And I just love his consistency. He brings it every single No question. Weekend. No doubt. And I think there is a reason – Part of their their defense, their renaissance, if you will, on the defensive side of the ball is largely in part because of his play, but also his leadership from playing at linebacker. Now, when you talk about leadership and you talk about a team that is playing as well as anybody, you got to talk about Isaiah Moore and NC State. Now, if Peyton Wilson were healthy, this would be an evolved conversation about the Wolfpack on defense. And Drake Thomas could still make it that before the end of the year. But right now, this is the guy. There is no singular leader, I think, more important to his team right now on defense than this guy is to NC State. Well, what I've loved about it, and Dave Dorn talked about this even before the season, his collection of linebackers, he wouldn't have traded for anybody in the country. They are that good. Right. And when you lose uh, Peyton, it was almost like, all right, next man up. And that's exactly what they've done. Mm-hmm. But that defense has swarmed people. They've been consistently good. Right. Uh, and it's almost as if you have to pick somebody there, right? And I think it's also interesting, too, Wes, that as we're sitting here at the midway point, and I know they've been suffering with a ton of injuries. We haven't had a Clemson guy mentioned here. Because, I mean, you can talk about the Clemson offense being a disaster in terms of not being able to get out of its way. But defensively, they've been out of sight. But we haven't thrown a name yet well, on anybody at the midway point. No, and, and I think we would have – if Brian Brzee had oh, stayed healthy. But he hasn't. I mean, he's been right. Out. That guy was dominating. Right. I mean, it was he was getting doubled every time. And, you know, Murphy's played well, Xavier Thomas, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the, the defensive combination, wherever you want to go in this, if you're an ACC football fan, right. trying to pinpoint a singular defensive, hey, that's the guy. It's hard to do. Yeah. It really is hard to do. And it's – um. Uh, you know, it'll be intriguing to see how the second half plays out, to see if somebody mm-hmm. emerges as the alpha out of this group. But I, I think it's really difficult to pick yeah. a defensive midway point, the guy. Packer and Durham. This is the Packer and Durham podcast. Packer and Durham on a beautiful, crisp Thursday morning in October. Emerson celebrating her big birthday. Happy birthday, Emmy. The Swiss about ready to go up oh, to man. West Point. Okay, here we go. I'm telling you, I, Wake Forest <clears> fans, have if we you got haven't any, got a ticket, you need to make I, this You can't trip. get one. It's sold out. You can get tickets. Can I? Uh, can we get some sort of official reaction from the director of athletics about you and the Swiss at this point? Sure. It's once a week as John Curry joins us from Winston-Salem. John, good morning. It's great to have you here as always. Thank you for your time. Yep. We're 
We Good morning, it. man. And before I start, I got to give a shout out to my mom. You know, Pac, she's only about three miles from where you are. So, hi, mom. Had a boy, John. Way to go. By the way, before Wes asks a really important question, I got to tell you, I'm parched. You got anything to drink up oh there? You got anything to drink? I'm parched. <laughs> I highly recommend <laughs> Deacon Brew, and you can go down to so you can go down to your local Lowe's Foods grocery store. And you can pick up some Deacon Brew from R and D Brewery. And it's been a great hit this year. Oh, Got a boy. Light Let it and go. Fresh. I'll tell you what. Tell you, if if there's not a six pack delivered to the basement so we can showcase that here in the studio, shame on you. If there's not sponsored. We're gonna have AD uh, sending us things. I know. mean, we got hey, Boston, man. Boston College sent us some red bandana brew the other day. I mean, we. We got that up the top shelf right yeah, there. Top we got shelf. red bandana yeah, brew. I mean, Pat's good, but I think we had Deacon Brew before he had red bandana nah, brew. Nah, nah, uh, you know. But I'm ass- I assure you that my man Rhett Hobart uh, is ready to ship you a. We're not going to send you a six pack pack. We're going to send you a twelve pack. Oh, <laughs> I tell you That's what. It. Yeah. I, it says, you know what? When you're ranked sixteenth, just send the whole pallet. <laughs> 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 All right, John. Buy me a personal delivery. There you go. Clock. That's Bef- it. Before we get to the Deacons march on the Hudson River this weekend, let me ask you, can we get some sort of official reaction from the Wake Forest University Athletics Department about PAC's continued use of the Swiss when talking about the Deacons? Well, you have to. we'd have to bring in Vanessa Connect from our women's golf team, um, who is Swiss and played great down at Chapel Hill last week. Um, but uh, I get it, you know. Who doesn't like it? And I'm a big fan of that Alpine Vista and all that kind of stuff, so. <laughs> So I'm all with you. We're, we're open for everyone. That's one of the best things about having the best fan experience in North Carolina. It's easy to get in, easy to get out. Um, you know, we don't have 80,000 people at our games, but you don't have to wait in line at the bathroom with 80,000 people. Kind of like, kind of like Switzerland. Exactly. And you've got Deacon Brew. I mean, goodness gracious. I mean, what more do you need? Hard to beat that. Good right. football, too. Thanks right. to Dave Clawson. No well, doubt. that, okay, that leads us to Saturday. Um Wake Forest is in the top 20. You've got a great team, undefeated team, obviously. But coming off a bye, this one feels a little sneaky, but I know Deacon fans are excited to be going to Gotham City for at least the weekend and also uh, up to Mikey Stadium for one of the great environments in college football from a scenic perspective on Saturday. We're, we're very excited and, and very honored. It's an honor to play at, uh, at West Point. Uh, Mike Buddy is the athletics mm-hmm. director there. He's a classmate of mine. I uh, played for the Yankees. Uh, great, uh, great leader. And I was talking to Coach Clawson on the way in this morning. Um, and it, this game has his full attention. Obviously, they have an extraordinary uh, head coach, defensive coordinator. They've done a great job. You saw um, how close they played Wisconsin last week. Um, it'll be a very, very challenging game. Uh, for the Demon Deacons. Yeah, Jeff Munkin's done a fabulous yep. job. And, uh, you know, that bye comes at really at a terrific time. Number one, right in the middle of the season. Number two, it really does give you, number one, a chance to get healed up. And number two, just the prep work necessary. I know that Dave's worked on it in the spring, fall camp. you got to do a little bit of that when you take on the service academy and that style that Jeff Munkin has. So I think it's an intriguing game. And, you know, the other thing, too, John, and we saw it last night. Here we go again in college football this year. Ranked teams losing. And I don't, I don't want to bring a negative vibe to this, but it is a reminder that, hey, if you got a number beside your name, man, there's a target on your chest this year. Now 48 ranked teams have lost this year in the AP poll. And I know the Deeks are going up there going, hey, man, we're going to put that to bed. We're going to win this thing and move on. But, man, alive, it has been a crazy upside-down year. So what does it feel like as we sit here now mid to late October in Winston-Salem And you take a look at the standings. I know it's not the finish line, but, man, you just get a sense of, hey, we are sticking our nose in everybody's business, and we really do have a great chance to get to Charlotte to play for a championship. Well, I can assure you that getting to Charlotte is the least of anybody's uh, (laughs) uh, thoughts uh, in the football office and Sutton Sports Performance Center this morning. Um, They're completely focused on this game. But it's actually very interesting that you say it, Pac. You know, our next four games – um, the way it works out, even though we're 4-0 in the conference, our next four games, only two of them are, are conference games. And so we, we step out of conference and out of the conference race uh, this week to play Army. Uh, next week against Duke uh, is a game that does uh, matter in terms of uh, getting to Charlotte or not. Obviously, we want to win every game. Uh, the North Carolina game in, in three weeks in Chapel Hill is, is huge for lots of reasons. Um, but, you know, this is one of the non-conference games that mm-hmm. uh, Ron Wellman and Bubba Cunningham scheduled a couple years ago, which I think w- was, was a great move uh, by both of them. 
Um, so now with that stretch, Duke, North Carolina, and NC State, three games in a row, you know, for guys like three of us who grew up around here, you know what that means. That's the Big Four championship. Yep. And, you know, going back, I remember when Mac Brown came to uh, Chapel Hill. I remember him talking to, to Woody. Wes, you remember what he used to say? Woody, we got to win the state championship before we can win the conference championship. That's right? it. And yeah. So Mac Brown used to talk about that. That's really important. So this stretch right now, the next four games – um, you know, obviously starting with this weekend against Army and then two games in Winston-Salem and one game at Chapel Hill. It's great you know, for the Demon Deacon Nation. It's great for the state of North Carolina. Uh, and it's great for Winston-Salem. John, this comes in a, in a season that your coach talked about in the summer to Mark and I. We've referred to it dozens of times as being potentially the most exciting and the most competitive college football season we've seen in a while. For a school like Wake Forest, smallest FB, one of the smaller FBS enrollments, certainly one of the smallest Power Five enrollments, what do, what do we glean from this from an administrative side, though? What are you seeing here that makes this different? Is it the super seniors, which Wake has several of? Is it the, the transfer portal, combination of both? Well, it's it's really a lot of different things, Wes. But, you know, seasons like this, you know, Dave Clawson is in his eighth year at Wake Forest, mm-hmm. and – uh, if you look back at Wake Forest histories, we've had some great moments uh, over time. And if you look at this century, Wake Forest is uh, is 44 and 20 against the schools in the state of North Carolina. We're, we're 30 and 20 against uh, the other big four schools. But the success that Dave Clawson has brought to Wake Forest, um, uh, certainly he is the key to all of that. And he is the, uh, the engine, so to speak, and the mastermind behind it. But there's also been a really significant investment in football at Wake Forest over the last eight years. If you think about the Sutton Sports Performance Center, uh, the incredible things Bob McCrary, uh, who himself came to Wake Forest on a football scholarship 50 years, 60 years ago, uh, all those things, uh, Dr. Hatch's leadership, our new president, Dr. Susan Winty, has been extraordinary in her leadership, our board of trustees. All together, it's worked to put Wake Forest in a position where um, we, we not only have a program that can, that can have a special year, and we've had a special first half of the year, but is also a program that can be a consistent winner and be a sustainable program. And with the facilities, uh, the support, the incredible faculty we have, uh, all those kind of things add together. You know, it's lost on a lot of folks that um, we've had about 80% of our students each game, or for two of our four games, 80% of our students have been in the game. Mm -hmm. How many schools in the country, other than maybe the service academy, have 80% of its student body all on site at the football game uh, at the same time. It's a pretty incredible uh, combination of factors uh, that is propelling our program forward. John, you know what, though? As, a, as somebody who grew up in Winston-Salem and, and Wake's been close to our family, needless to say, for since dirt, um, there's always been the great balance, though, between academics and athletics. And it's one of the things I've always loved about Wake Forest, that, hey, no matter how crazy life is, in the college landscape, Wake Forest always has an understanding of, hey, here's the big picture. And we're sitting here talking about a team ranked 16th in football. We're getting ready to get started in a hoop season. Your, your Olympic sports are doing great. Uh, you know, what you're doing in the classroom, quite frankly, is even more important than all of this. Uh, that 96% graduation rate, you know, you can't just go ahead and say, oh, yeah, that's, that's a given. You know, that's something that needs to be bragged upon. That's, to me, it's one of the mm-hmm. things that separates the ACC from everybody else. The balance of athletics and academics is important, and it's a mainstay in this conference. There's no question, and, but it, it's not a hindrance to success. Our coaches at Wake Forest, whether Dave Clawson or Kim Llewellyn or Bobby Muse or Tony Deleuze, mm-hmm. they all use that as an accelerator towards success. And the opportunities to come to a top 30 uh, university to be taught by world-class faculty and small classroom sizes, um, you know, and, and from an athletic perspective, you've been to campus and seen the investment. All of our athletic facilities are right on campus. You know, there's mm-hmm. not getting in your car to drive 10 minutes to the golf course or, 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 or drive across or get on a bus to go to football practice. It's all right here. Our soccer stadium, uh, Spry Soccer Stadium, which um, hosts the most number of college soccer fans in the country in 2019, and we'll have another great uh, fan attendance uh, this year. we got a great game against uh, on the ACC Network Extra tonight uh, for women's soccer. Um, but that that uh, those facilities are right on campus, and that's a huge advantage. And then you take the, uh, the the graduate offerings at Wake Forest, including our business school. So if you watch our game on Saturday, you'll see two starting offensive linemen, uh, Michael Jurgens, uh, our center, 
and Zach Tom, who is a Campbell mm-hmm. Trophy semifinalist. Mm-hmm. They're both already graduated from Wake Forest. They're enrolled in the NBA program at Wake Forest right now. So you talk about a college athlete extracting full value out of the opportunity that comes from college athletics. The student athletes at Wake Forest across our 18 sports are doing that. All right. Here's one thing, by the way. This trip to New York in October, uh, I'm going to say timely for Wake fans and alums, but I'm going to say from an uh, athletic development perspective, probably a good time to go to New York City and, uh, and brush up uh, against the pockets of some of those uh, big Wake grads, huh? Obviously, we got we got tons of alums and fans and parents uh, in the tri-state area. <clears throat> in fact, uh, I was told this week that you know there's a ferry that goes from uh, Manhattan, uh, New York, up to uh, West Point, and uh, there was one originally scheduled, and apparently they've had to book three more with like 200, 250 people <laughs> above uh, because of all the Wake fans in the area uh, that want to get up to uh, to Mikey Stadium and see the Deeks play. Is Stuart Mandel aware of that, that Wake Forest apparently bringing more than 37 people to a road trip? <laughs> yeah. Just saying. Yeah. I, 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 I do want to – I did hear from a couple of Wake fans who were concerned about Stuart's comment a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's – obviously, Stuart respects the Deeks. And, uh, you know, we look back at uh, even you know going to New York two years ago to play Michigan State. 3.8 million people watched Wake Forest play football that day. Um, we had over 10,000 Wake Forest alums and fans who were at that game. Uh, you know, our, our friend Art Pal- Eric Palms at the Orange Bowl, you know, continues to talk about the 25,000 Wake Forest fans, uh, friends and alums who came to the Orange Bowl in 2007. So, uh, you know, coming off five consecutive bowl games, uh, we've qualified for a sixth bowl game, but you've heard, uh, which is the third longest streak in the ACC, uh, but you've heard uh, our coaching staff and our players, um, that, that's, not an expe- that's not an entitlement to play in a bowl game. Um, but at this point, our, our program and our student athletes are not satisfied with just mm. being in a bowl game. But it is nice to have, especially a national, international uh, uh, fan base and alumni base like Wake Forest. Uh, it is nice uh, to be able to think about every year. Hey, we got to save, got to save a little time uh, in that holiday ca- uh, calendar to make sure we can get to wherever the Deeks are playing. Hence the Swiss. Everybody welcomes them. I'm just telling you, it's a perfect fit. It's a perfect tag. We speak, we speak multiple languages. You know, That's it. Southern English, Northern English. You know, you name it. John, uh, parting thought here, very quickly. Again, administrative perspective, if nothing else. Uh, a week from tomorrow <clears throat> at South Bend, Indiana, the ACC is going to stage its cross country championships. And I don't know if you know this, but eight days ago, the commissioner. Uh, named Mark Packer as the driver of the rabbit. Yeah, and John's laughing for some reason. And, and by the way, it's not. Uh, he called me the rabbit, and we've called it the Pack Mobile. Yeah, uh, it's really the Chariot of Champions. Chari- <laughs> so, the chariot of Champions. So, so, so I like that. Any any concern about Packer being involved in an ACC championship from a from an official capacity on your behalf? Uh, No, I think it's great. And one of the things you need to keep in mind, that ACC universities are on the leading edge of medical care and emergency (laughs) management, right? So, you know, you know, I'm sure our friends at uh, at Notre Dame have a great EAP emergency action plan. They got AEDs. They got they got probably got a chopper there for you, pack if you need it. So, uh, um, you know, we could bring you right down here to Atrium Wake Forest Health for the trauma center. Take care of you. Get you patched up. Get you right back on the air. You know what? I don't need no stinking medical help. I just need some Deacon Brew in the cooler, riding shotgun. <laughs> wait a second. Brew. Now we're going to have, wait, I can see Curry involved. Cargan's going to send Tuffy Lager, whatever it is, over. I mean, we're going to have a whole – Pat Craft's sure, already sent Red test. Bandana. Hey, you know what? I bring everybody together. Love this, all This serval, crazy right? idea yeah. is turning into absolutely a brilliant plan. All right. Chariot of Champions. Hey. That's, that's John the beauty B- of college athletics. It is, yes. We that's all come it. together. That's there right. There you go. Uh, great to see you. Be well. Safe travels to uh, the Hudson River Valley. Good luck. Thanks very much. Go Deeks. Go ACC. All right. You bet. John Curry, AD at Wake Forest. Uh, <laughs> that was awesome. By the way, when are we going to take this show to Winston-Salem? Oh, no. Here we go. Huh? <laughs> oh, boy. I'm just, I, I'm just asking. I mean, you know, we're in the basement. I shouldn't be pushing my luck. They're going to allow me to go to South Bend next week. But at what point in time can we take this show to Winston's My City? What about the quad? Is that where you'd like to be? Up on campus at the quad? 
Got no problem with that. White chapel in the background. Got no problem with that. Well, I feel smarter going on the Let campus. me tell you something. You know where I went to school, kindergarten? Wake Forest University. <laughs> Swear to God. They still have that? I don't have any idea. We need to find Wake that out. Wake Chapel. Probably my had to close that cla- not My long kindergarten after. class was right beside Wake Chapel. And I would walk every day yeah. from that classroom down the street to Billy's office. Did you go by the little snack shop at the bottom of the dorm? Yes. Yeah, that place was awesome. A little so, deacon shop. Deacon shop. Right. Oh, man. I think it was S-H-O-P-P-E, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah, there we go. Here's Mark Packer and Wes Durham. Packer and Durham. Yeah. That'd be Chester and Fuller, sound asleep. Yeah. Uh, Otto is excited. Just saw him during the break. Did you? He's back in the Christmas decoration room. That's, uh, of course, right beside Mrs. P's refrigerator filled with beverages, knowing Deacon Brew is on its way. <laughs> it's so good. Nice. Otto is excited. Once again, Otto wins. Otto he often wins. does. Yeah, he often he's does. He's back there. He's seriously. He's back there with the Christmas decorations. Yeah. And everybody feels sorry for him because he sits here in the in the chair with the the million dollar electronic equipment that's in the house. That's now it. To make sure this thing can fly. Right. And the closest thing to him is Mrs. P's refrigerator. It's okay for him. He loves it back there. Yeah. Nice and cool. All right. Uh, let's take a look at what's, uh, what to watch for tonight, presented by Carvana. Carvana. Yeah. Hey, Carvana. Nice. How's it going? Welcome. Welcome to the Packer and Durham program on this uh, Thursday morning. All right. Now, the ones highlighted, those two women's soccer matches are on the ACC network. Boston College is at Pittsburgh. That's at six. And then at eight tonight, kids. Watch out. Top-ranked Florida State, number seven, North Carolina. Anson Dorrance, by the way, in search of 900 career wins. He was, They were upset by NC State last Saturday. Knowles have won three of the last four over the heels, including the 2018 title match. Florida State is the only unbeaten, untied team in the country. They have had some epic matches. Yep. That will be good stuff tonight. So we're uh, looking forward to... One versus seven tonight at 8 o'clock in women's soccer on ACC Network. There is a full slate of action as well. John Curry, good enough to mention that uh, Spry Soccer Stadium, 7 o'clock tonight, a little big four action with NC State and Wake Forest. Louisville is at number two, Virginia. Cavaliers have had another good year. Miami at Virginia Tech. Syracuse at Clemson. And number 15, Notre Dame Pack, is in Durham to see number six, Duke. All on the women's soccer slate tonight. And that's what's to watch. What to watch for? Brought to you by Carvana. Like it, that Florida State North Carolina thing. That's no joke. Now you're talking about some serious talent. You those know those two. Those two have a nice rivalry too. It, it's good. I had an interesting conversation. You know, you know what I love about? Didn't mean to interrupt. That's you. all right. But you know what I love about that series? Hmm. North Carolina is kind of like the old school, right? Old money, like the Yankees, right? And, and Florida State's had this incredible run. Mm-hmm. You know, they've just been awesome and now dominant. And it's kind of like old school, new school. It's really a cool setup that yep. those two get together. Totally they, with it. They played unbelievable matches. Um, I was reminded that in the chronology of soccer history, Florida State's program, as you know, is not that old. Right. I mean, it's Their women's soccer program is less than 25 years old. They have had remarkable success, and you know what North Carolina has been about. So now you take those two at this particular spot in the road, and to think 900 wins for Anson Dorrance? That's a bunch. Gosh. He's been brilliant. It's not like they play 40 matches a year. You and I did a deal years ago about ranking the Mm -hmm. all-time coaches in this league, regardless of sport, and you had him number one. I did. Yeah. I did. I, you start looking back and national championships, ACC oh. titles, wins. I mean, the numbers are stupid. Yeah, and Dean Smith once said, you know, we're not a basketball school. We're a women's soccer school. <laughs> I mean, in some ways, he's right. Coming from that guy yeah. at that particular time, that's a strong statement. Yeah. Just, a, I mean, you talk about an unbelievable run. And, uh, man, a competitive guy, too. And that goes back to, remember the conversation we had with him about his relationship with Roy Williams when they were both in school? Mm-hmm. Um, that's the conversation. And I know we, we talk about long form program ideas. I'd like to have sit downs with guys like Anson Dorrance. Well, listen, because he talked you, one time about the difference. Remember when he started coaching, he was coaching the men's and the women's teams. Yeah. And he talked about one time and I was, I was able to hear the interview. I think he did it with my dad 
about the difference in coaching the men's team and the difference in coaching the women's team. Not just strategically, but the psychology of the women. The Packer and Durham Podcast. Ms. Holmes, please raise your right hand. She was the darling of Silicon Valley. Magazine cover after magazine cover. But now, accused of massive fraud, she faces decades in prison if convicted and continues to maintain her innocence. This is not fake it to you, Megan. This was a product that didn't work. I'm Rebecca Jarvis, and for more than five years, my team and I have been following the case of Elizabeth Holmes, and we're here to guide you through every development of her trial, from the new evidence presented in court to how the jury might react to her new life. New episodes of The Dropout, available Tuesdays wherever you listen to podcasts.